Troy First Baptist Church, August 30th, 2020. Let's stand together and sing Shout to the Lord. Welcome to Troy First Baptist Church. Here are a few announcements to add to your calendar. Make sure to join us after service for Family Recreation Day. We'll have Sweet Tea's food truck handing out tacos for your family for lunch from 12 to 1 p.m. Whether you watch our service online or in person, come grab lunch for your family on us. Don't forget, our youth meet in the youth building at 5.30 each Sunday evening, and our youth small groups meet today at 5 p.m. Our children are still currently meeting on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock on Facebook. Make sure to invite your friends to these weekly meetings. Make sure to stay updated with everything we are doing here at Troy First Baptist Church and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also check out our website at TroyFirstBaptist.net. At Troy First Baptist, we take a country every week and pray for it. Today, we ask that you take a moment and pray for the people of Gabon. Despite Gabon being wealthy in resources, many continue to dwell in poverty. This is largely due to decades of neglecting the nation's infrastructure and to prevalent corruption that prevents the country's wealth from trickling down to all. Women and children are vulnerable to poverty through lack of education and social norms. Exploitation and trafficking of children are particularly evil situations. Pray for righteousness to prevail over those seeking to gain profit at the expense of others. 
Let's pray together for the nation of Gabon in Africa. Lord, we pray for the million and a half people in Gabon that you died for, that you love. Thank you that many of them know the gospel and know Jesus as their Savior. We do pray for those who know you to be bold witnesses. We pray for the uh, poverty and the corruption in that country. Lord, we pray that you'd watch over them, keep them safe during the virus, keep them safe uh, from all harm. But Lord, we pray that you would bless them spiritually, help them to grow and to be like Jesus. Lord, help us here in Troy and in America, Lord, to turn to Jesus and help us to make a difference in the world in which we live. For in Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's sing together about how great is our God. to 
us pray. Lord, thank you for the freedom to worship you, not only as we are free to gather politically, but we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Lord, we pray that today as we hear from your word, that we will hear from you. Lord, I pray that you take the words of our speaker this morning and use them because they are from your word change our hearts and to change our lives. For in the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen. Kryptonite, you have probably never seen it. I guess I'm pretty sure you've never seen kryptonite. You've heard of it. It's not on your periodic chart of elements because it doesn't exist. Kryptonite only exists in the comic book pages of your superhero, Superman. You see, 
He was supposedly born an alien on a foreign planet that was about to die, so his parents mercifully sent him off in a rocket ship to Earth. But then when the planet Krypton blew up, some of the matter from Krypton landed on our planet, and it was somehow harmful to Superman could weaken him or even kill him. It was a necessary plot device because when you've got an immortal hero, it's not very much drama in the story. So they invented kryptonite to give Superman something to overcome. You should know that the Bible is full of everyday heroes without superpowers like Superman. You've met last week Jephthah, one of the judges, Gideon. But there is one true superhero in the Bible, the Bible Superman, and it's me. I have an S on my chest, but it doesn't stand for Superman. It stands for, can you guess, Samson. Yeah, last week's speaker introduced himself and didn't keep you in suspense because you never heard of him, Jephthah. But if you've ever been in church, you've ever been in Sunday school, you've probably heard stories of me, Superman. And surprisingly enough, Although I'm not an alien like your Superman, I do have kryptonite, my Achilles heel, my secret weakness, and that's really the message that I have to share with you today, a real hero's secret weakness. Now, I don't want to appear to have a big head, but although my head is rather large, literally, I did make the Bible's Hall of Fame, sometimes called the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. You can find my name in Hebrews 11.32, listed along the great heroes of the Old Testament. What more shall I say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson, there's me, and Jephthah, yeah, him too. Also of David and Samuel and the prophets. Wow, I'm there with all those great guys. And notice our exploits that are listed in verses 33 and 34. These heroes through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Wow, sounds like a comic book or a movie hero, doesn't it? Violence, valiant in battle, fighting aliens. I'm sure when you read Stopping the Mouths of Lions, you probably think of Daniel, right? In the lion's den. Do I have to remind you that he just sat there while the angel protected him? I don't want to brag or anything, but I actually tore one apart with my bare hands, and I didn't need angels protecting me, or so I thought. The story is found in Judges 14. Uh, I wish there was a camera there to record it, but there wasn't, but it's in your Bible, so that's even better. I went down to Timna with my father and mother, and I came to the vineyards of Timna. That's a problem you'll learn about later. Now, to my surprise, a young lion came roaring against me, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily on me, and I tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat. You ever torn apart a young goat? That's not so easy. Though I had nothing in my hand, not one weapon, I am not some fictional character like Superman. I'm a real hero with real heroic courage and, as you can see, superhuman strength. Now, I'm just being honest here. I am alone among the everyday heroes of the Bible able to leap tall buildings in a single bound and bend steel with my bare hands. Later in that same chapter, Judges 14, 19, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon me And I went down to Ashkelon, the capital of Philistia, our enemies, and I killed 30 of their men. Wow, 30 on one, and I beat them, and may I remind you, without a gun. Or in the next adventure, chapter 15, I caught 300 foxes. Now that sounds like your hero James Bond more than Superman, but I'm not talking about those kind of foxes. I caught literal animal foxes. Have you ever tried to catch one fox? That takes some agility and some speed. Here is my super speed. I caught 300 of them. Then I tied their tails together. And it doesn't sound real nice. Don't tell the animal cruelty board. But I lit their tails on fire. And you can bet they were running like crazy through all the crops of the Philistines and burned them all down. That's pretty amazing. 
But then later on in chapter 15, I was just messing around and I allowed myself to be tied up by the Philistines. And when I shook myself, it was like flax burned with fire. My bonds broke loose from my hands. And look what I did next. I found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. File that away in your mind. That'll be important later. I reached out my hand, I took the, the donkey's jawbone, and I killed a thousand men with it. Wow. What are the bad guys supposed to do when I can beat not just 30 men, but a thousand men? Give me one jawbone and I can beat a thousand men. I do have an Achilles heel. I do have some kryptonite, a secret weakness, and so they had to find it. And that's where we come to in today's text, Judges chapter 16, verse 21. Here's the end of the story. Spoiler alert, at the end, they capture me. The Philistines took me and put out my eyes and brought me down to Gaza. They bound me with bronze fetters and I became a grinder in the prison. There I am, captured and blinded. And you think, whoa, how did that happen? How did the man with the S on his chest end up in prison? How did they finally overcome the original Superman? You should know that I am the model for the ancient myth Hercules and the modern myth of Superman. How did they capture me? How did they blind me? What is my kryptonite? Here's my question for you. Is it possible that you too have a kryptonite? Maybe the same one as mine, a secret weakness? Let's rewind to the beginning of Judges 16. Flash back to the story of the last chapter of my life and see how this all started. Chapter 16, verse 1. Trouble right away. Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there. Gaza is in Philistia, the very capital, and what was I doing there? I'd been terrorizing them for 20 years now. Everybody there knew me. My picture was in every post office in town. And I couldn't exactly sneak into town. I couldn't be a spy. Everyone would recognize me. Was I there on some business, doctor's appointment, maybe going shopping, looking to pick a fight? No, the Bible writer doesn't do me any favors. He tells what I was doing. I saw a harlot there. I just happened to see one. No, actually, the truth is it's embarrassing to admit, but I was there looking for one. I was prowling. My lust was driving me. Got an idea what my kryptonite was? I saw a harlot, and then it says I went into her. Okay. I can be honest with you and tell you, can I? I wasn't going in to evangelize her or witness to her. And the secret was out. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for me all night, the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, in the morning, when it's daylight, we will kill him. They didn't want to tangle with me at night. So how did they find out? Doesn't tell us. Maybe she snuck out to the bathroom and called him on their cell phone or... Maybe the word passed, someone saw me go into her place. But they were nervous, and they knew that I'd beat a thousand guys. They knew I was dangerous, so they were waiting for morning. Did I know? Yes, verse 3, I lay low till midnight. How did I know? Super hearing, super smarts, it's not that important. The important thing is what I did. I laid low until midnight, didn't wait for morning. I arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city, and the two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on my shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now you think of a gate on a fence, and you could carry one of those, but this is the city gate. I mean, I don't, we don't use pounds, but for you, this would be like a thousand pounds. This was my most incredible feat of strength my entire life. I picked it up, a thousand pounds, carried it nine miles, and do I have to tell you it's uphill, 3,300 3, feet hill. Here's the sad thing. It is my greatest feat of strength, but why did I have to use it? To escape a house of ill repute. Pretty sad. And what's really sad about it is you've gotten a glimpse into my kryptonite, my secret weakness. This feat of strength not only is at a bad occasion, it also went to my head and became my last, or should I say my next to last, feat of strength. Yes, my kryptonite is sex, verse 4. 
afterward, after I escaped there, you think I learned my lesson? No. It happened that I loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. I loved her, or I thought I did. Delilah is a Hebrew name. She was a Philistine, so maybe this was just her professional name. I'm pretty sure she was a prostitute as well. In the story, it's pretty obvious she's for hire anyway. The Philistines had tried force. That didn't work. So now they bribed her to get my secret. Find out where his strength lies, they ask him. By what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. Hmm. To some people, these words mean that I wasn't some muscle-bound hunk, that my strength was strictly the spirit, that I was a skinny little runt, and wouldn't that be just like God? God loves to use the weak to impress the strong, but it doesn't have to mean that. They just want to overpower me. They want to know my Achilles heel, and their belief is in magic. Maybe there's a magic word. Maybe there's a magic substance we can put on. I'm kind of like Popeye's spinach or something. Sometimes we all fall for this belief in magic. Maybe it's not a lucky rabbit's foot, but rather a hope that if we have lucky devotions in the morning, God will give us a good day, or maybe we'll have a good week if we put in our lucky tithes. But verse 5, here was their offer. Every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. There were five of them. So they were going to get, to you, that would be about $3,500. Now, I know to you, most of you, that would be chump change. You keep that in your sock drawer. But I have to tell you, back in my day, $3,500 was a small fortune. This was the reward money for the capture of a wanted man. So, Delilah said to me, Please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And so... Here it comes. At first she tried the direct approach. Please tell me. No, both give me the secret and the purpose to capture you. Why would she mention that? Slip up? I should have been a little bit more suspicious, I suppose. I'm not really stupid. I had a clue what was going on, but I was stupid. I toyed with her. So I said to her in verse 7, if they, I knew it wasn't her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So I lied to her. Imagine that. She wasn't exactly being honest with me either. I said seven fresh bowstrings. Now you shouldn't imagine strings from a music store made with plastic or metal. They would be made of catgut. What the significance of that is, like the jawbone, it's something dead. As a Nazarite, I was not allowed to touch anything dead. I had a strict code that I was supposed to keep, and one of the three prohibitions was don't touch anything dead. But here I started flirting with danger. So in verse 8, sure enough, the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound me with them. Okay, come on, Samson, think about this. What's wrong with this picture? You give her the weakness and she ties you up? Verse 9, men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. I know that now. She said to him, Philistines are upon you, Samson. She tried to startle me, but I broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of my strength was not known. Those who don't know God will never understand his power. Shame on them, but shame on me. Nobody knew God was the source of my strength, and it seems even I had forgotten that. So they don't pop out because they see that they haven't got the secret yet. But I didn't figure it out. I was playing with sin, playing with fire, or in my case, playing with kryptonite. Of course, if you play with fire enough, you'll get burned. But the Bible tells me, the Bible tells you, you don't have to get burned. There is always a way of escape. God knows, God cares about your temptation. He won't allow you to face more than you can take. He'll always make a way of escape. In my case, it was right there in front of me, marked exit. I could have run, you know, like Joseph did when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife. 
I could have and should have dumped her right there. I mean, she tied me up and lied to me. Come to think of it, I shouldn't have been with her in the first place, right? But I stayed and I played. I thought, what happens in Gaza stays in Gaza. Nobody will know, nothing will happen to me. I'm life's great exception. I'm Samson. But there was round two in verse 10. Delilah said to me, look, you've mocked me and told me lies. Yeah, he told me lies too. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. I'm sitting there on the couch in my dirty undershirt. I think I was watching a ball game. And she's whining, blah, 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 blah. This should have been a red flag, right? This is the second time she comes after me. And I said to her, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. I know what you're thinking. Samson, why did you even talk to it? Why did you say it's none of your business? It's a good question. I'm sure you've never done anything you've regretted, right? No, I didn't say none of your business. I teased her. Maybe I saw some new ropes and subliminally thought of that. But nothing could be further. I actually, I'm getting further from the truth. The cat gut was a little bit closer. So in verse 12, here we go again. She just happens to have, they didn't have to bring. She took new ropes and bound me with them and said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. Hmm. So when she finishes, I jump up and say, Ta-da! The men were lying in wait, but I broke them off my arms like a thread. You know, I'm a man. I was showing off my strength. Surprise, surprise. She wasn't the least bit impressed. They behind the curtains were now getting mad. Curses foiled again. Now it's time for round three in verse 13. So I'm not brightest bulb on the tree. I didn't learn a thing. Delilah said to me, until now you've mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. So now I'm getting daring. You know what I mentioned? My hair. I said, if you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom. Now, if you weave my hair, I'm not going to be weak. But I was toying with her. And I got a little bit closer. If you, my, if you know my story at all, and I'm sure you know better than Jephthah's story, right? You know, it has something to do with my hair. I know you can't tell now that I've got it cut. But I used to have long, big hair. But the secret was not weaving it or brushing it. Wasn't putting in a ponytail. So she starts doing exactly that. She wove it tightly with a batten of the loom. You got to know that hurts. And... I am a pretty sound sleeper. I was wide awake letting her do it, but then I fell asleep. I shouldn't have fallen asleep. I should have known what was going on. This is the third time, right? But I got tired, and my eyes drooped, and she went, she says, Samson, the Philistines, and I awoke from my sleep. I was asleep in more ways than one, literally and figuratively. And I just pulled the batten out, and then I was sorry. Then I pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. Oh, that hurt. I busted up the whole thing, and after I stopped crying from the pain, uh, yeah, I do feel pain, I started to laugh. And then comes round four of a four-round fight. She said to me, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? Okay, guys, you know she's pulling out the heavy artillery now. Tears, that's male kryptonite, isn't it? And she says, how can you say you love me? Now, this is usually a guy's line to a girl. Girls, if a guy ever says, how can you say you love me? If you don't do this for me, then leave him right away. Guys, just pack your bags. We're going on a guilt trip. How can you say you love me when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me these three times and not told me where your great strength lies. Tears, manipulation, guilt. Oh, yeah, one more. She says the big bazooka for last. Verse 16, she nagged me. It came to pass when she pestered me daily with her words. And I, I want you to know, I didn't give in in round four very quickly. But this went on for a long time. And nagging works, right? Every parent knows. Daddy can have candy? No. Daddy can have candy? No. Daddy can have candy? About the 15th time. Okay, just have some candy. I was worn down. My soul was vexed to death. If you've ever been met nagged, you know what that feels like. And I told her all of my heart. I finally gave in and told her the truth. 
I said, verse 17, no razor has ever come upon my head. Can you tell? For I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I'm shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. I explained to her my Nazarite vows. Sometimes today, most of the time, it is assumed my hair was the secret of my strength, and cutting it would be my kryptonite. That's not true. Actually, the spirit is what made me strong, and the secret of my strength was obeying God in three different vows, two of which I had already broken. If you go back to Judges 13, you see there are three parts to the Nazarite vow. A Nazarite can't touch anything that comes from the vine, and I had a feast at my wedding. Remember, I was in those vineyards. Can't touch anything dead. I've already done that several times. Oh, and can't have his hair cut. So actually, the hair on the head is only the last straw. And so I am hanging on to my connection to God by a thread, by my hair. You see, it's clear my vows were no longer a matter of conviction, but a matter of convenience. You never, I, I never really saw the angel that told my parents what I could and couldn't do. Maybe one time a long ago, I really believed the message that the angel had given my parents. I adopted my parents' strict standards that kept me from being like all the other kids, but they were never really my standards. Oh, they were God's standards, my parents' standards, and they'd become a habit for me. But I had long since forgotten why I was even keeping them. Like sometimes your convictions, the things you won't do, which crumble the minute you move away from home or when you're away and you think nobody's watching. Or what you do, devotions for instance, and you just keep on doing at a habit, like going to church or having devotions, a habit you quickly break if it's no longer convenient. Well, that's what happened to me. So verse 18, on with the story. She's not stupid. Delilah saw that I told her all my heart. She sent and called for the lords of the Philistines. This time, it really is true. Come up once more. For he's told me all his heart. You can see her saying, show me the money. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought her the money in their hand. Verse 19, this time, she does intentionally lull me to sleep. She called the barber. She wanted to make sure to get all the hair. And boy, I really am a sound sleeper. He shaved off the seven locks of my head. And I never woke up. And then she began to torment me, beat on me. Maybe at one point she really loved me and respected me, but obviously by now she had no respect for me. I'd been using her, lying to her constantly. I'd shown my utter lack of integrity. So now she despises me and she can't wait for the opportunity to start beating on me. She began to torment me, and my strength left me. She said, the Philistines are on you, Samson. Or should I say, I left my strength. It wasn't my hair, but it was the final straw, the last vow broken. She says, the Philistines are upon you. And so Baldy gets up from his sleep. And here's what I thought, believe it or not. Yeah, I'm going to go out as before as at other times and shake myself free. Is that because I can't feel the breeze where there's never been a breeze before? Or even knowing that my head has been shaved, do I think, well, I already touched dead stuff and I already drank some wine. No big deal. Do you know who I am? I'm going to do just like before. Isn't that tragic? But I did not know that the Lord had departed from me. Wow. To me, maybe to you, my loss of power seems rather sudden. But I have to tell you, it wasn't. It was gradual, piece by piece. Kind of like the emperor's new clothes. I didn't know I was naked at a gas and coasting. I didn't know the Lord had departed. There's the real secret. It wasn't my hair. It was the Lord. I, too, thought it was kind of magic. Before, they didn't know the secret of my strength. But now, I didn't know the secret of my weakness. What a tragic figure I was. Like a tree that's rotten to the core. Looks fine outside, hollow inside, that was me. 
One small wind blows down that tree. All it took was a haircut to blow me down. Sudden nose, gradual. My fall is a tragic lesson, one that every one of you ought to learn. I can tell you firsthand, sin always takes you farther than you wanted to go. Sin always sneaks up on us, gradually, subtly, eats away at our soul until we are hollow and don't even know it. Oh, we fool ourselves and presumptuously think, I can handle it. I am life's great exception. I won't go all the way. No, nobody signs on expecting to end up in the gutter, in the pig pen, in the prison. Drugs, drink, oh, I can handle it. One more. Sex, just part of the way, just once. But say it with me. Sin always takes you farther than you wanted to go. You can do better than that. Sin always takes you farther than you wanted to go. Proverbs 30, verses 15 and 16 warn us, there are three things that are never satisfied, four things that never say it is enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not satisfied with water, and fire that never says it is enough. I got news for you. There's five. Sin never says it's enough. Okay, I can just have one, like potato chips. No, you got to have more, right? The football coach, the priest, the Academy Award-winning actor, the millionaire tycoon who abused little boys. Did they set out to do that? No. They started out with a secret weakness, a krypton just like me. Lust. Pictures. That wasn't enough. And pretty soon, their voracious appetite, like a fire, burned everything down. Sin will always take you farther than you wanted to go. Back to my story in verse 21. This is where we came in. The Philistines took me and put out my eyes. I don't even want to describe that to you. Brought me down to Gaza. They bound me with bronze fetters, like your handcuffs. And they made me a grinder in the prison. They blinded me, but I was kind of already blind, wasn't he? They bound me. I was already bound, wasn't I? I didn't know. I was my own worst enemy. But I became a grinder in their prison. You see my downfall? Blinded. Binded, grind, blinding, binding, and grinding. Worst of all, now I was a cause for blasphemy. Because Dagon, their god, father of Baal, was the grain god, now I am grinding in tribute to him. I had been a man who was outwardly strong and inwardly weak, but ultimately, eventually, this inward weakness showed. Verse 22, now we've come full circle to where we started. I am bound, blind, grinding. Let's finish my story, verse 22. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. What does that mean? Hair grows, I'm going to get my strength back? Not necessarily. But what does it mean? It means the Lord is working slowly and imperceptibly behind the scenes over time. This shows the passing of time, right? Hair doesn't grow overnight. Maybe it's a symbol of hope. As long as I was alive, my hair would grow, and as long as my hair would grow, there was time for me to repent. Maybe blindness and slavery could teach me what strength and debauchery never could, that God alone was the secret of my strength. My hair begins to grow back, but notice, I still don't get out. I don't get my eyes back. I was still stuck. Maybe I should have read the fine print. There is a second lesson you can and should learn from my sad life story. Sin not only takes you farther than you wanted to go, sin always keeps you longer than you wanted to stay. Yes, God forgives. But here's the truth, nature does not. God can wash away the stain of your sin, but the scars will remain. The guilt can be taken away, but the blindness remains. The loss of freedom remains. The lost time and opportunities I would never get back. The people I hurt and let down. The problems I couldn't fix. The damage you've done, you usually can't undo. God has a graciously short memory, but others do not. Say it with me. Sin always keeps you longer than you wanted to stay. Numbers 32, 23 puts it this way. Be sure your sin 
will find you out. I thought I'd gotten away with it. I'm life's great exception. No, you always reap what you sow. Sin never encourages you or even lets you read the fine print. Never lets you see where it inevitably leads and sin always keeps you longer than you wanted to stay. Take it from me. One last time, go back to my story, verse 23. Happily ever after? Not exactly. The lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to go and their God and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has a delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. No, he hadn't. I had. They foolishly misinterpreted my failure as evidence that their God had delivered me into their hands and that our God was weak and non-existent. What a tragedy. I made God look bad. I got the power to make God look bad. Verse 24, look at sin's foolish celebration. When the people saw me, they praised their God. They said, our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land. Yeah, I used to proudly take that title. The one who multiplied our dead. Here they are celebrating the victory of evil over good. But I'm here to tell you that every victory of evil is temporary and every defeat of evil is eternal. On the other hand, God's every defeat is temporary and God's every victory is ultimate and eternal. God allowed me to reap what I had sown, but he would not allow his name to be consistently blasphemed. And so in verse 25, it happened. When their hearts were merry that they said, call for us Samson that he may perform for us. Here was their weakness, pride, revenge, and they call for me out of my little prison to come and make fun of me, I guess. Let's dress him up in a frilly costume, get him to dance for us and throw vegetables at him. So they called for me from prison and I performed for them. This is the most humiliating point in my life. Not only am I alone in a prison, but now I am the I'm the subject of mockery. I'd never had that problem on the playground as a kid. I performed, what a tragic failure, what a waste of potential. And I hit bottom yet, I was reduced to a laughing stock, a big buffoon, a sad spectacle. So sounds exactly like a time for the grand finale. They stationed me between the pillars. Verse 26 tells us there was a lad who held my hand. He was my seeing eye boy. Was he a Hebrew who spoke my languages that I told my plans to, or a Philistine who I lied to? I won't tell you yet. But I said to him, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. I'm a little bit tired. I need something to lean on. It says, now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof, watching while Samson had performed. They're all watching. I don't play poker, but something tells me a straight beats a full house. And I was playing straight with God, and they had a full house. And guess who wins? Verse 28. Samson called to the Lord. I want you to know, here is the greatest miracle in my life. Not my last feat of strength, but the fact that I finally called on the Lord. I prayed. I finally knew I need. You know, sometimes strong people don't think they need the Lord. Sometimes rich people don't think they need the Lord. When you don't think you need prayer, you really need prayer. For perhaps the first time in 20 years, I prayed. I mean, I really prayed. After blinding and binding and grinding came finding. And I said, Lord, remember me. You never have to tell the Lord to remember you. He never forgets you. Strengthen me. Oh, you do need to pray this. Strengthen me, I pray. Just this once, oh God. Never prayed that prayer. That I may be with one blow, take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. I finally discovered the secret of my strength. It wasn't my hair. It wasn't my willpower. I also figured out the secret of my weakness. Verse 29, I took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and I braced myself against them, one on my right and one on my left. And then I said, Lord, let me die with the Philistines. 1972, not too long ago for you, your archaeologists discovered an ancient Philistine temple, and to their surprise, sure enough, the entire structure with a roof and balcony was supported by two main central wooden pillars. 
So I prayed my heroic prayer. Did you learn from your speaker last week, never sacrifice somebody else, sacrifice yourself. I sacrificed myself. I was a real hero because I sacrificed myself. Lord, let me die with the Philistines. In verse 30, he answered my prayer, like he usually does, not by doing it himself, but by giving me the strength to do it. I pushed with all my might. For the first time, it really was hard. And the temple fell on the Lord's and on all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. Wow. All the people. Samson, aren't you forgetting somebody? What about that poor little boy at your side? Did you let him die? Come on, man, give me credit. Of course not. What kind of jerk do you think I am? I told him to get out, sent him on an important errand, and I waited for him to get clear. How else do you think the writer knew what I prayed? But notice, the dead at my death, yes, I died. The little boy didn't, but I died. There's no unrealistic Hollywood ending. My crushed body was under the rubble. I lost not just my freedom and my sight, but my pride, my testimony, and my life. I killed more people in my death than I did in my life, but that's small consolation. There is a touching personal note in the last verse of the chapter. My brothers and all my father's household came down and took my body, brought it up and buried me between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of his father Manoah. I had judged Israel 20 years, could have judged another 20 if I hadn't been such a knucklehead. But here's the personal note. When I died, it wasn't just a statistic. There was a family, a grieving family left behind. It's one thing I hate about your violent movies. I've seen two, that's two too many. Every time there's dozens or hundreds of deaths, it's just like over and done with, yawn, and you don't see all the funerals, fathers and brothers and sons and daughters. There is a grieving family. There are hundreds of casualties for each murder, isn't there? There's not only the tragedy of my life, what I missed and the missed potential, but the tragedy of my broken-hearted family. Was it a selfish prayer? Were they really proud of me at the end? I don't know, but there is a third lesson you can and should learn from me. Sin always takes you farther than you wanted to go, always keeps you longer than you wanted to stay, and always costs you more than you wanted to pay. You ever heard the adage, if you have to ask how much it costs, you can't afford it. Yeah, sin comes with a tremendous markup, a huge cost, and the price tag is always hidden. One time when I was a young judge, still a little bit more in touch with my people, I took a group of boys to the zoo. Yeah, we had a zoo. And one of the little boys kind of glommed on to me, and when we went to the gift shop at the end, he only had one shekel. He said, can I get this? And it was way more than he could afford. Everything in the zoo gift shop is more than he could afford. And then he asked me, can I get this? And I had to say, no, you can't afford that. And then he took me to this, and he can't afford that, and you can't afford that. Pretty much I learned there was nothing in that whole gift shop he could afford. And what I want to do is I want to do the same thing for you and tell you, no, you can't afford that. No, you can't afford that sin that so easily besets you. Say it with me, sin always costs you more than you wanted to pay. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, and sin is a tough taskmaster. You see it literally and graphically in my story. It's not so obvious all the time in our lives. Sin always costs you more than you wanted to pay. Believe what James says in chapter 1, verse 15. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. James is not kidding. Oh, yes, you can be forgiven totally and immediately. But don't you dare think that that sin can be taken less than seriously. It will cost you everything eventually. I lost it all gradually, imperceptibly, didn't even know it. I lost my reputation, my position, my strength, my freedom, my sight, my life. But I want you to know that I am more than just the historical basis for the myth of Hercules and the other superheroes. 
I'm more than just the only Bible superhero. I am a huge cautionary tale. That's what I'm here for today. I'm a warning to every one of you. I strangled a lion, but I couldn't strangle my own lust. And that's what got me. And if you don't control your lust or whatever your kryptonite is, it will take you farther, keep you longer, and cost you more than you can possibly imagine. I burned the crops of thousands, but I was burned by one woman. I could beat a thousand men, but not one woman. If I'm honest, I was really beat by one man, myself. There's the tragedy. I broke the chains of my enemies, but I couldn't break the consequences of my own choices. No matter how strong you are, you're always free to choose, but you're never free to choose the consequences of your choices. If you can identify with me in the beginning of the story, you're on top of the world, and now you're playing with fire, flirting with sin, imagining yourself immune to its power, I have bad news for you. Sin is kryptonite to you, fatal. If you identify with me more at the end of the story, you're broken, binding, blinding, and grinding. I have good news. Troy First Baptist Church, your hair is growing. God has not forgotten you. God wants to do amazing miracles through you. Have I got good news? Yes, I am the tragic Old Testament hero, but I am also a fuzzy picture of the ultimate real hero in the New Testament. You see, both I and Christ sacrificed in death and conquered in death. Think about it. Jesus gave himself but in his death, many are saved. In my death, Samson's death brought death to his enemies, but Christ's death brought life to his enemies. Yes, I say there's a fuzzy picture because there's a big difference. John 15, 13 says, there's no greater life than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what, not what I was doing at the end of my life. Christ laid down his life for his friends, even worse, his enemies. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so here's the difference between me and Jesus. I stretched out my arms in vengeance, and I said, God, avenge me. But Jesus stretched out his arms on a cross in love and said, Father, forgive them. Pretty different, isn't it? Don't look to me as a hero. When you were kids, maybe you took a towel and ride it around your neck and ran around like it was a super cape and you could fly and beat up bad guys and you flexed your muscles. Don't follow the guy with the S on his chest. I want you to follow him as your example, the man with the scars in his hands. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the cautionary tale of Samson. And Lord, if there is one here who's never surrendered their heart to Christ, I pray that today they might come in simple faith to Jesus and accept his gift of salvation as that is offered freely on the cross. We thank you for dying heroically for us on the cross. Lord, for those of us who are believers, sometimes we think we're like Samson, life's great exception, and we think we can toy with sin and get away with it, that we won't be hurt. Lord, remind us today through the story of Samson the power of sin to destroy our lives from the inside out when we don't even know it. Lord, help us to treat it seriously as you thought it was serious enough to die for. Help us to hate it enough to avoid it, not only to avoid our own destruction, but because we love you and we want to bring a smile to your face. Your head's still bad and your eyes still closed. If you're here today without Christ as Savior, I invite you to make him Lord of your life. You can pray something like this in your heart to the Lord and mean it. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I know I deserve death and hell for my sin against you. But I thank you for loving me and dying on the cross for my sins. Come into my heart and my life. Forgive my sins for Jesus' sake and make me the person you want me to be. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to pray with you, pray for you. Would you let me know? Here at the altar, by email, call me on the phone. If you're a Christian, the Lord has spoken to you this morning about some sin, some kryptonite that you're toying with, would you dedicate that to him right now? Let's stand together and sing 
It is well with my soul. Let's just sing the first verse of It is well with my soul. When peace like a river 